Hello, welcome to the final um, live event that we're doing as part of Black History Month. Um, so we've got Carol with us today who works for the Open University and she's going to be talking to us about ordering and prominent black people from Victorian Britain. Um, after she has presented, we'll do a Q&A at the end, so I'll ask her all your questions. So throughout the talk, if you can pop them into the Q&A box, we'll answer them at the end. So I'll hand over to Carol now. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for um, coming to the se this session. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about prominent and ordinary black people in uh, Victorian Britain. And I have to say that uh, I hope that you enjoy this uh, presentation. Uh, the information of ordinary black people in Britain is not a story that we often think about exploring um, and you know particularly because we have our economic structures um, that we we play out in contemporary society and um, we often think about um, black people um, in the past particularly um, Victorian black people with a, a, a kind of a niche uh, narrative and this has really robbed us of the important information that um, black people have were living in um, in Britain uh, as ordinary people, just like myself and you know other black people who are living in Britain today, contemporary Britain today, and they were actually um, contributing successfully um, to Victorian society. And unlike uh, uh, the stigmatization that we have um, today, um, because there wasn't that history in uh, Victorian society that they were actually woven into English society as government officials, they were soldiers, you know, sort of defenders of a country, they were tradesmen, entertainers, they, you know, founders of, of families, and they've and they kind of um, left a, a legacy that we um, have overlooked and actually uh, forgotten and um, it's sometimes it is difficult to trace the descendants because uh, uh, some of the these black people married um, you know white partners just you know in the same way as I have a, a white partner and their children have married um, white partners and uh, they have uh, it eventually sort of disappeared and um, and of course then the history uh, tends to be diluted in society and and um, they uh, became forgotten and uh, what I want to do really with this um, short piece is to kind of highlight um, you know how black people were integrated into society and um, as ordinary people and then I want to bring to your attention you know about four prominent people in uh, society and and the journey of how they contributed to British uh, society or English society and um, and then how that became lost and then kind of found again. So I thought it would be nice to go to Kent because, um, you know, when we think about uh, Victorian Britain, we always think about London and that's really because, um, you know, we have all those narratives and, uh, from uh, Charles Dickens and, um, you know, I certainly think the first thing I think about when I um, uh, try to hop back to Victorian Britain, I think about Oliver Twist and um, Mary, Mary Poppins. But, um, you know, and these are, are great favourite films of mine from when I was little. But if we kind of think about um, Victorian Kent, that can give us a snapshot of what um you know what england was like uh in the victorian times and how um the empire as in the british empire if you like i kind of when i was reading about it thought oh actually this feels a bit like the european union where people in the british empire were all british subjects and um they were all, you know, British, and they could travel anywhere around the um, British 
empire so they could go to Australia. Indeed, there were some black people who uh, went to live in Australia and they all went to the, you know, into various parts of the um, British empire and they could, they could travel freely without a problem, providing that they had, um, you know, that British stamp and, um, and we, and, you know, all of us as British recognised that England was the mother country and then was the head of that. So if we kind of take a snapshot of, of, um, of Kent, we'll see the first records of black people in Kent are from the 16th and 17th century. And in the, the you know, in the Victorian century, people, the Victorian age, um, that's when things really became, you know, sort of recorded a bit more because there was, um, you know, census that went around and, and were trying to figure out who was living and working in the UK. And of course, um, what we have in Kent are, in, in the Victorian period and beyond, are, um, you know, black seamen. And there were various people who, and, you know, who had married and lived in um, various uh, areas in Kent and um, they were just working ordinarily and living a normal a normal life and this wasn't uncommon I mean there were they were people who were living in towns and, and ports and of course I thought I'd list a few in terms of you know there was Gravesend, Chatham, Fathersham, Dover I mean you can read it for yourself and of course if we go to London we'll find that people lived in um, Greenwich, um, the River Thames, and so on and so forth. And, and they also lived in towns and villages in the area. And there were a range of, of black people in Kent. And, um, you know, some were born in the country, some were born in England, and some, you know, came to live their lives and were, you know, sort of resident and, and actively, you know, working and, and living. And, and they are and they are recorded. And of course, we will see later on in this, um, this presentation that um, I have taken a record of, a, of the first black policeman who was working in and around Kent. And he, his name was, for, I think by coincidence, um, John Kent, but we will go into that um, later. And of course, now that we've taken a snapshot of, um, of Kent, and it, my reasons for doing that is if you take a snapshot of a place, then you get a picture of the, um, the whole uh, country. So if you, you know, sort of uh, uh, can see the trends and patterns that um, happen in a particular area, then it can give you a wider picture. And of course, having done that now, we can sort of um, visit London and see some of the things that happened during that time. And it was interesting. I mean, as I said, I'm sure everybody enjoys the pub. And um, certainly when I was young, um, not so much now, because I'm, I'm an oldie, um, I'd go to the pub with some of my friends, um, like we all do. But the public house, um, in those days were owned by black men. Black men were found across the country uh, running pubs and some of their wives were um, white, some of their wives were black and there was you know sort of uh, mixed families and black families all around but it was very common to go into a pub and find a black landlord. Also in the same vein as we have um, you know this kind of modern slang. I think um, I have younger children and they are now sort of becoming teenagers and particularly the boys, they might um, uh, speak in a, a way that I don't really understand because they have a, a slang which has a, a Caribbean sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, ring to it. And it sounds all very trendy. And in the same way in Victorian England, um, the twang at the time for among, you know, sort of ordinary people was um, of African origin. So there was, they eventually 
um, because there was so much of it, they um, actually uh, created a dictionary called the Dictionary of Vulgar Tongue. And I, could, I should say it might be trendy words nowadays. Um, and of course, there was, you know, sort of lots of slang words which were actually of African origin. And I put one in, which was a, a kickapoo. So, you know, you might say, oh, Edith, um, you know, she, she's um, suffering because her, you know, that her, her uh, husband did a kickapoo the other night or something like that. That's how I'm imagining it. But the language, African language, was integrated into everyday English language. And of course, um, like today, we kind of mirror the Victorians in this way, that there are uh, many intermarriages between black men and white women and vice versa. And there are many um, families. And, and um, there is a record where um, as there was an, an author who I can't, his name escapes me now, but he went to um, Liverpool and he, because he wanted to see, um, you know, a different kind of England, what England was like. And much to his surprise, he found among, you know, the working and middle class uh, families in particular, um, that they were mixed at the time, and that there was a lot of, um, you know, um, interracial marriages and, and, and children from interracial marriages. And um, that's uh, something that was recorded. And of course, um, black people could be found in the Church of England, and uh, this is because um, they were not prohibited in any way to join the congregations and settle into parishes. And they were very active um, in the church. And the first, um, at least one of the first black churches was recorded to um, be in a white chapel at the time. So that kind of gives, a, you know, sort of a, a snapshot of how ordinary people lived. And if you can sort of, um, you know, put that into your imagination and, um, try to kind of piece all of these together. It's a very different um, uh, uh, Victorian society uh, than the one that I was told when, you know, I certainly uh, was a child. And um, I actually feel that it, it is, um, you know, a very exciting and, and interesting that um, Victorians were very much, um, you know, sort of multicultural and and outward looking and it makes sense because um, they went to other people's countries and they brought back other people's cultures. I mean, we all know that the British cup of tea is, um, is something that has been taken from India, you know, so, so a lot of these cultures were taken back to the country, but obviously if you go and you colonize, um, you know, sort of different parts of the world and you make, the people in these different parts of the world, um, British subjects who are, you know, have allegiance with the country, then of course you would, you will create um, a, a multicultural society because this, in fact, is a sign of a, um, a political and and world power. I mean, it wouldn't be, it it wouldn't be the same as Iceland because Iceland is a, a small country that doesn't have, you know. A, a lot of power. It has a lot of powerful friends, but doesn't have, you know, that kind of empire that is, um, that we experience, um, you know, in terms of with, with Britain. So now we explored that, we, you know, sort of have a look at some of these people that I was talking about. And um, there was a footballer who, um, felt that he would be he would be the first footballer in the 1980s and silly for me because I'm having a senior moment I can't remember his name <clears throat> but um the name I do remember is John Kent and he had a police career that started between um 1835 and 1846 and he married a lady called Mary Bell from Longtown and they had three children um, William, Mary and Jane and they settled in the Carlisle area and he was employed as a constable at 
Mary Port, and he actually became the pillar of his society. And, um, you know, he was seen as somebody who was upholding the law. And of course, um, <clears throat> he, you know, he had a, a very fruitful career in terms of he, when he moved to, um, when he was at um, Maryport, he saved his colleague from a threat to his life. And he dealt with that. And, you know, and this issue was, um, was very serious. And um, he fought against a group of men and who injured him and he brought them to court and brought them to justice. And, uh, and again, I mean, this was quite impressive. Um, he saved a 17 year old boy from drowning, but this boy tra tragically drowned, um, you know, sort of, uh, tragically died six hours later. And um, he also, as well as being a fire, uh, a policeman, he also served in the fire service because um, policemen at that time wore two hats. They were not just, you know, sort of police in the community, they were also um, firefighters as well. And people used to um, refer to um, John Kent as um, Black Kent. And of course, he was used, you know, against naughty boys. So they would say, if you don't behave yourself, um, then we're going to get Black Kent and he's going to arrest you. So apparently, you know, sort of frighten the children in the community because he had, um, you know, that, that much authority. Unfortunately, though, um, in 1844, he, he was uh, dismissed um, because of drunkenness. And this wasn't really uncommon among um, uh, policemen at that time, uh, because uh, uh, drinking alcohol, it, and one of the reasons for having many pubs, uh, was because people, uh, the water was unsafe in the Victorian period, uh, there was cholera and typhoid, so uh, people would actually go to the pub. And, um, and also, you know, the fact that it's because they had a lot of um, human waste that was thrown around in the street also at that time. And so, um, like many of his colleagues, um, he was uh, dismissed uh, for, for uh, drunkenness. And um, then he went to the car line magistrates where he um, served a short period of being a, a bailiff for the court and then he then became the parish constable of once again in, um, in Longtown and um, you know he kind of dealt with um, a, quite a few incidents and in 1851 he became the railway policeman in Carlisle and you know he he kind of did this for the remainder of his life until his retirement. And then he died in, um, at the age of 81 from peritonitis. And in the local newspapers at the time, they, the headline was death of a Carlisle no, um, nobleman or, or notable would, re would really be the word. So the death of a Carlisle notable. And then he was um, buried in the cemetery in an unmarked plot and uh, which was uh, very sad uh, uh, that he was buried um, in an unknown grave but his life was later revealed um, by uh, an author who was a policeman himself in 2018 Raymond Greenhow and it's um, if you want to look at the book it's called um, John's life was revealed in this new book which was uh, you know, I think it's called John's Life, and it's published um, in March 2018. So, and I feel that this is a, a wonderful story and shows how, you know, um, black people contributed and were, you know, sort of a real, really part of, of a Victorian uh, society uh, in its time. I'm sure we're all familiar um, with. Uh, Mary Sequel, and she uh, was the first nurse. And um, Mary was actually born in 
uh, Jamaica and at age 12 in 1818 she helped to run a boarding house um, where there were many guests and the guests were sick and injured soldiers and then three years later she traveled to the UK with her relatives and she stayed there for about a year and this gave her the opportunity to really understand European medicine and she used that in conjunction with uh, traditional um, Caribbean techniques of you know using herbal medicines and then in 1823 um, she went to London on her own and she remained there for two years and um, then she traveled to Cuba and then she traveled to Haiti and to the Bahamas and then she returned to um, uh, Jamaica Kingston in, in 1826 um, to nurse her patroness so she you know there's a kind of pattern there where she's um, always seems to be nursing um, sick uh, people throughout her life. She did marry and um, she married Edwin Sequel in, in 1836 and they ran a store in a place called Black River. I'm sure if anybody's been to uh, Jamaica, uh, Black River is a place where you can go on the, the crocodile tours and there's YS Falls and, and you know all sorts of nice things nowadays. But anyway, going back to Mary, um, Edwin became unwell. She nursed him until he died in 1844. And then his death was closely followed by her mother, which was devastating for her. And then in 1850, she nursed, she decided to kind of go and nurse victims in Kingston who had the, because there was a cholera epidemic and then in 1851, she traveled to Panama where there was another outbreak again, and then back again in 1853 to Jamaica where she was, you know, battling with um, yellow, the yellow fever uh, pandemic. And then from there, she was visited by the medical authorities um, to supervise nursing services in Uptown, in Up Park, um, in Kingston, which was the uh, British Army headquarters. And of course, she then reorganized herself and she decided to um, open a lodging house, which she'd built, which was rebuilt after a fire, which was her actual home. It was called um, Blundell uh, Hall, that's what it was called. And she used that to um, start a hospital because um, then she began to see these, um, you know, these young men who were or an old soldiers, I guess, as um, her own children, because she had nothing uh, left because her mother and her husband had died. So she became, you know, sort of um, attached to them, almost like a mother. And I think um, she had motherly feelings towards them. And she was known as um, Mother Sequel by a lot of the soldiers. And of course, the Crimea War, um, which lasted between 1853 and 1856, which she's most famous for, uh, that was um, fought by coalition against the Russian Empire. And she traveled to England, approached the British um, War Office, and she asked them if she could actually go to Crimea, and they, they refused, um, you know, point blank. So she then went back and she, you know, sort of got her money together. And uh, she, as a very determined woman, she went to um, Crimea, which was part of the Ukraine at the time. And she established the British Hotel um, with, her, with um, Thomas Daly, who was a relative of her husband, Edwin. And the hotel was a place for respite for sick and um, you know, suffering soldiers and kind of help them to recover. And um, Mary at that time, they became very well known with uh, Florence Nightingale. And um, I think Florence Nightingale's hospital, she had a, a famous military hospital, which was situated about 100 miles away from the front line. It was just outside um, Istanbul. And, but Mary's hotel was in Balaclava, 
balaclava, sorry if I'm not saying that right, which was very much on the front line. It was on the battlefield. And um, even under fire, sometimes she would go out and she would um, nurse the soldiers and, you know, sort of do uh, last rites for her. And this is why she was established as um, Mother Sequel. And then at the end of the war, she actually returned to England with very little money because she had actually invested all of her money uh, trying to get the soldiers better. And um, the soldiers then, understanding that she didn't have any, a lot of money, uh, wrote letters to a newspaper praising what she had done. And the Times correspondent, um, Sir, um, sorry, Sir William Russell wrote, I trust that England will not forget one who nursed her sick, who sought out her wounded to aid and suckle them and to perform the last rites for officers for some of them who, for some of her illustrious dead. So this kind of tells you, you know, the gravity of the relationship that she had um, with those um, soldiers. And a lot of them admire admired her a lot of people did and they came to her aid there was um soldiers generals and even members of the royal family at the time and they held a gala in 1857 a fundraising gala which would help her you know and that was held over four nights on and it was held on the banks of the river thames which tells you how important she was in her time because 80,000 people had actually attended the event and you know and of course i mean this is all uh, recorded in the wonderful adventures of uh, mrs sequel in many lands which she wrote and became an instant bestseller but it was it has been said and um that florence nightingale lobbied the government lobbied the government tirelessly to ensure that she would not be honored and that she would not be recognized for her work which I find, you know, sort of very sad. And she died in London in 1888, and her history was forgotten for about a hundred years until some nurses from the Caribbean who knew of her went to visit her grave in Northwest London, and they asked a lo local MP, um, uh, Lord Clive um, Solney, uh, to help them. And he, you know, he promised to raise some money for a statue and in 2004, um, Mary was actually voted as the greatest Black Britain. And um, Lord Solely launched the campaign for a statue after leaving the House of Commons in 2006. Uh, the, the statue was eventually unveiled. And um, it is found on the grounds of St. Thomas's Hospital on uh, London's South Bank. And I think she's left a a very good legacy and um you know i think uh, again she's a, a, a wonderful role model and kind of shows um it, the the sacrifices and it shows entrepreneurship and um her you know sort of true guts and achievement and an absolute loyalty to to british uh, society as a you know, a black Victorian Britain. And I, you know, I kind of um, uh, feel very, um, what's the word? I feel very proud to, to tell this um, story. And I know that she is well known anyway, but um, you know, I think it's a, a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, story to tell. And um, the next person, and I'm sure you can see that I'm, kind of giving you a variety of people because um, you know there are a variety of narratives and there are so many more um, black Britons who had um, contributed to Victorian uh, society and I thought this time it would be good to look at um, a, a musician and this is Samuel Coleridge Taylor and he used to call himself the Anglo-African. And he um, incorporated black traditional music with concert music and uh, with such composition, you know, as African suites, 
uh, African romance and um, 24, 24 um, Negro melodies. I mean, these are things that he's, he kind of, um, some of his uh, compositions. Um, he's most um, famous for his performance with the Hiawatha um, Wedding Feast, uh, which was described by the principal of the Royal College of Music as one of the most remarkable events in the modern English musical history. And um, that work was uh, really acclaimed both in the USA and in uh, the UK as well. He was born in Holborn in London um, on the 15th of August on 1875. And his, his father, Daniel Peter Hughes Taylor, came from Sierra Leone in, to Britain in 1860. And he studied medicine and qualified as a member of the Royal College of, Sur of Surgeons. And he practiced in Croydon and went back to Africa and was appointed coroner of, of, the, of the Gambia in 1894. And in 1890, at 15, um, sort of going back a few years, 15 years old, Samuel was so clever that he entered the Royal, School, um, Royal College of, of Music as a violin student. And after two years, he, he kind of swapped over um, his studies to composition. And his tutor, Charles Villa Stanford, challenged him to uh, write a clarinet quintet without showing him any influences, you know, in terms of um, any composers like Brahms or anyone like that. And um, Coleridge Taylor, he did it. And when he, when this early work was revealed in um, 18, in, sorry, in 1973, years later, the New York Times critic called it something of an eye opener and a short piece of writing in the post romantic tradition, sweetly melodic. And that's how it was described. But going back into the 1800s, so 1896, he met the um, African American poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar and set some of his poet, poems to music and called it African Romances, which is something that I mentioned earlier. And in 1897, the two men gave joint performances. He also met with um, Frederick uh, J. Loudin, a, a former director of the Frist Jubilee Singers, the choir that introduced African American, African -American spirituals to British audiences in 1873, and by 1898, Elgar, I'm sure everybody knows Elgar, then England's leading, he was England's leading um, living composer, described Coleridge Taylor as far and away the cleverest fellow among the young men. A few weeks later came the Triumph Hiawatha um, wedding feast, which captivated the public and established him as Britain's outstanding young composer and however you know so despite its enthusiastic um reception uh i think coleridge taylor didn't didn't actually receive very many rewards for his work at the time and um in order to live he you know he did he had to teach and he had to conduct to to um uh you know sort of earn a living and he died um, in 1912 as a professor of composition at the Trinity College of Music in London, and as well as the conductor of the uh, Handel Society, uh, the Rochester Choral Society, and, and he conducted many uh, provincial um, orchestras. So you can see that you know, he was a um, multi-talented um, person. And in fact, he was very, very talented because he was invited to um, uh, America by uh, President Theodore Roosevelt at the time. And he kind of championed, um, he, he was championed by uh, black Americans because uh, uh, talented black Americans were not recognized, um, you know, during that period for uh, obvious reasons. 
and um, so uh, he was very much a black American a hero because he was invited to uh, the White House in a very difficult time. Um, and as I said, he lived in England until he, he died and um, he contracted pneumonia at the age of, of uh, 37. So he died um, very young and he left two daughters and both those daughters uh, had distinguished careers as uh, one was a conductor, Hiawatha was a conductor and Gwendolyn uh, was a, a composer. And uh, again, you know, I think a very interesting story. Um, hopefully you're still all engaged in this and um, I want to go on to, for, you know, for the men particularly, somebody a bit more exciting. Um, Arthur Walton, and Arthur Walton was born in Ghana in 1864. His father was Grenadian and half Scottish and his mother was from a Ghanaian royalty. And he moved to England to train as a missionary, but he quickly got bored with, you know, sort of religion and um, religious and academic life. And he actually went to pursue a sporting career and he found that he was extremely talented and he kind of, you know, broke a record with a 100 meter dash in 10 seconds um, at Stamford Bridge. And he was, you know, this success gave him opportunities to compete in professional athletic tournaments across the country. And, um, and this is where he really um, found his abilities as a professional um, in, in professional football clubs. Uh, he was first signed as a semi-professional um, player with Preston North East in 1886 as a goalkeeper. And he's, his highlight with Preston was to make it as to the FA Cup finals in 1887, where they lost actually 3-1 three, three to West Bromwich Albion. And there was speculation at the time that Arthur was good enough to play for England. And, um, you know, and of course, then in, in um, 1889, he turned uh, fully professional and he signed up with Rotherham, Rotherham um, United and in 1894 Sheffield United decided to poach him and unfortunately his you know he um, that move was not successful because he was actually getting older and um, he was competing with uh, younger uh, goalkeepers I think one was really famous called um, Fatty Flukes who was quite famous but um, you know having a uh, um, you know, had a, a fruitful um, uh, football career. He retired in 1902 and unfortunately he started to drink heavily. I'm sure this is um, one of these things that happens in Victorian society. And, you know, as we saw with John, with uh, uh, people going to the pubs, because uh, water was not very accessible. And um, he died in um, in he died uh, in 1930 um, and as, a, as somebody he was uh, penniless and um, his story was actually uncovered in 1997 and uh, it was uh, because of the football um, clubs were experiencing uh, racism and they decided to um, start a, a campaign which was uh, Football Unites racism divides and um, I think somebody found another unmarked grave in Ellington and um, and thankfully now because of the British, uh, British um, uh, football clubs he's now has been given a headstone and um, his picture is um, included in the exhibition of uh, British sporting heroes at the National Portrait Gallery. So, you know, another, another story to be uncovered. But um, I, I think it's important to say that it is, he is not the first um, black footballer, that there were many black footballers playing um, before him. And, um, but my reason for highlighting him is that he was the first professional 
um, that footballer to play in the football league. Um, but there are there are many many more before him. Uh, the next person that I have, and our final person, is a lady called um, Fanny um, Matilda Eaton, and she's of mixed heritage. She's um, uh, Jamaican and English, and her father, they say that his, her father may have been a, a British so soldier who died at the age of 20, and had actually um, funded, you know, found the funds for her and her mother and his daughters, um, to move to England around 1840. And they, you know, they settled to work. She wasn't rich. The mother was a, a laundress and um, Fanny married um, John Eaton, who was 19 and she was 22. He was a handsome cab driver and, um, and she was a, a cleaning lady. And um, what she used to do was she, she would go uh, and sit um, for artists um, to make some extra money and uh, they kind of described as um, her thick uh, they described her to have thick kinky hair which was exotic at the time uh, mixed race features which made her irresistible an irresistible model for artists and um, and of course she became uh, one of the members of a pre-Raphaelite um, brotherhood, um, you know, and of course her likeness, not only, you know, her, herself, but um, her likeness hangs today in many galleries over the, around the world. And, you know, it, uh, for example, the Tate um, in the British Museum, you can find uh, the Yale a Centre of Arts and Princeton Museum, um, of arts are, are some of the areas that you can find there um, and of course around the country and she she became a favorite um, model among artists who had been this member of the pre-Raphaelite um, brotherhood and of course Dante um, anybody who knows Dante um, Ray, uh, Rossetti who was one of its leaders described her in a letter to a fellow artist uh, Ford Maddox Brown and he'd written, you know, when that he'd written when Fanny was about uh, 30 years old as having a fine head and figure, a good deal of Janie. And of course, we know Janie's Janie, Mo uh, Janie uh, Morris, uh, which is the quintessential um, Raphaelite stunner, the lady with the, uh, you know, the long uh, ginger hair. So um, she she was really one of these beauties that was you know, um, uh, really quite up there. So she was she was thought of as um, uh, considerably beautiful, and uh, she she was um, really um, valued for her strong features and um, you know, as I said, her massive hair, and she you know sort of a, her grave sometimes you know sort of care care worn expression, as I said which uh, was very um, uh, sought after at the time um, for uh, the Victorian, you know, sort of attitude which exuded beauty. And uh, they painted and drew um, Fanny um, very often. And there are actually more, fa um, more portraits of um, uh, Fanny Eaton being discovered all the time. And um, and of course, uh, she, she, you know, she may have been kind of unknown, but um, uh, to us, and of course, we kind of know that she was never, it never did make her rich because she was constantly uh, working as a, a maid and, um, and as a cleaner. But we have to uh, understand that at this time, uh, pre-Raphaelite models were not, uh, you know, they weren't rich. There were only there were a few of them that uh, were educated and um, married well, and um, uh, but the majority of these ladies were servants, dressmakers, gypsies, you know, prostitutes even. Um, and I think that uh, the most famous of them were only famous because they were involved in scandals and um you know and they had affairs 
with the artists but um uh, Fanny was really married with uh, 10 children and um, I think she was probably just a very um, busy woman so she kind of you know sort of became unknown uh, after she had finished um, but just to kind of give you some insight um, some of the slides that, um, that uh, oh, sorry some of the uh, sketches um, first known sketches featuring Fanny's was made in uh, 1857 by uh, Simeon Solomon and um, he was uh, already noted as a draftsman at age 19 and he actually met Fanny by chance and uh, because he didn't actually live very far from her so I think he um, kind of asked her to sit for a few se sessions and sometimes he even used her to you know to kind of draw um, you know, people of different of different genders. Say, um, because she had a very interesting face that uh, the the uh, artist uh, could um, manipulate because her face was quite angular, even though she was uh, extremely um, beautiful. And um, he made a, a pencil study of her on the basis for a painting of. Uh, Moses' mother, which is shown um, at the 1860 Royal Academy ex exhibition, as well as a, a finished painting, as well as finished paintings, there are many uh, drawings, uh, often with her hair unbound and you know, sort of uh, looking a uh, uh, very uh, realistic, um, <clears throat> and you know, and uh, uh, textured as well. And of course, she was. Um, you know, Solomon's sister, Rebecca, uh, which is um, uh, uh, Solomon's sister, sorry, Rebecca, he painted Eton in a, um, in a painting which was a young teacher and um, who was a nursemaid being taught by the child that she was looking after. And also um, she was sketched by Rossetti in his painting, The Beloved which now hangs in uh, Tate, Britain, where she is um, among bridesmaids at the centre, um, you know, behind the bride. I think you can see her face in one of those um, paintings. Um, she also modelled in uh, classes at the Royal Academy between um, 1860 and 1897. And in 1888, Unfortunately, her husband died when she was 45, and that kind of left her to raise um, seven children. The youngest, Frank, who was two, and she never remarried. And in fact, I think this is where her career kind of uh, took a dip, if we can, you know, we can kind of call it a career um, as a, a modeling, uh, as a model, she it kind of took a dip. And um, she worked in um, uh, as a cook there on, for a wine merchant um, and she kind of lived in the Isle of Wight and in 1911 uh, she lived with her daughter and, um, and in Hammersmith uh, where she died nearby Acton and of course um, uh, she has actually left a legacy because her images live on in uh, various uh, galleries around the world and um, depicting, um, you know, beautiful heroines and and famous beauties. So, um, and it's and it's just very nice to you know sort of uh, be able to unpack that and and see um, the contribution that she has made, which is something again, which is uh, an everlasting one. So, having uh, given you some insight into um, you know ordinary and and um, prominent um, people, black people in Victorian Britain. I hope that this has enlightened you and shown you that there isn't just uh, one narrative and that there are more than, um, you know, there are many uh, other narratives about um, black people's contribution to Victorian society. And um, it's always worth, um, having an open mind and, and looking uh, deeply. And in fact, I find that this is, uh, you 
you know, very exciting uh, because uh, it gives another perspective on, um, you know, Victorian attitudes and, and Victorian lifestyles, um, uh, which is, um, you know, far from uh, what I um, could ever imagine. And I thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Carol. I thought that was really interesting. So thank you for putting that together for us. Um, we do have one question in the Q&A section. Uh, always a little to come through as well. But Kevin asks, in an age before moving around the world became relatively straightforward, do you have any thoughts about what led black people from around the globe to decide to pick up their lives and move to Britain and how daunting a step this must have been? Um, well, I would say that um, firstly, um, part of the human condition, I'm an, an anthropologist, and um, part of the human condition is uh, to be uh, travelling. Um, uh, people have always travelled um, across the globe, and that is, you know, what it means to be human. I mean, if we even think about um, Britain and you know, and countries such as Australia, which were black countries before, those countries have now been transformed to white countries, as has um, America and uh, Canada, and so on and so forth. So um, there is always a reason, and it's very important to think that there are always stories why people uh, decide to um, move from one place uh, to another. It's not always the case that people are poor or that there are wars. I mean, these are uh, common stories um, that we hear because we have we invite um, news into the news into our into our living rooms, and we we get uh, one narrative. Um, people often travel. Uh, maybe um, if we think about Africa. Uh, before colonization, Africa was a very rich place, but um, you know, after um, uh, Europe came out of the Dark Ages, it was a place of, of awe and wonder, and people wanted to understand, you know, who was the richest man on earth, and that richest man lived in, in, in Africa, you know. Um, so uh, there are many reasons why people may have wanted to come to England. I certainly know that um, in the Vic Victorian period and after, um, during colonization, uh, people used to think that uh, England's streets were made of gold and that the Queen was, you know, some magic mystery person um, and that um, England was the mother country and a lot of people had allegiance to that and we can even see that with the Windrush uh, generation that they came over and they had a, a completely different idea of um, what England would be like. They thought, you know, it would be a kind of movie lifestyle until they came over and, and realised that it was actually quite cold and a lot of hard work. But the people are very nice, you know. So, <laughs> so um, we can't kind of stick to one narrative. It's, it's very dangerous to, to kind of stick with one narrative thinking that people are poor and that they're coming over to um, get a better life. It is in some cases, but it is not in, in most cases. Hopefully that answers the question. Brilliant, thank you, Carol. Um, the next question is, is there any evidence of racism and or racial tension during the Victorian era? There was racial tension. I mean, there are, um, there are um, some texts written by Mary Sequel that um, she um, she did experience some racism. Um, I don't think it was as bad as it is in our contemporary world um, because um, there isn't the history of slavery. Slavery was happening at the time. And, and we have to remember also that slavery is happening in our time. It's just not the slavery of, of many black people. There's other people who are enslaved, um, a variety of people who are enslaved. And like, um, as we experience today, we are just living our normal life, but, um, and we don't sort of acknowledge that there are um, people who are enslaved because it's not um, part of our everyday 
narrative. Um, so there were people who ex experienced um, racism. And again, one of the things I have to say is that racism is a narrative which is not only um, con you know, something that is um, unusual to British society. It's um, a narrative that is experienced um, in every country all over the world. And it's not just for um, you know, people of a particular uh, colour. It is about um, uh, people stepping into a space uh, where they are not the majority. And that's how I would, um, I would uh, define racism. So it could be that you might go to Saudi Arabia and, um, you know, as a white person, they think that you don't have very many morals and or you're there, you know, to touch your hair and things like this and, and all of that kind of thing. It, it could be that. And in the same way, it could be you're in, you know, England and you are of colour and so on and so forth. So, um, but in Victorian society, racism did exist. It existed all over the world and um, it isn't anything um, unusual. And some of these people did struggle with, with racism. So. Brilliant, thank you. And the next question is, is there a book that compiles black Victorians? So any suggested reading? There is a book that compiles black Victorians. It's called Black Victoriana. And I will have to post you the, the That's all right. If you let me know, the, I, yeah, I can yeah, share I will that. <laughs> and, and, uh, Yes, and, and it, it covers a lot of, um, um, of, uh, of uh, you know, the happenings among black people in, um, in the UK. And also there is a lady, I think, her name is Cresswell, surname, and she's currently doing um, some research. Um, I think she was on the Royal, at the Royal, Brit um, Royal Geographical Society not so, not so long ago. I think she's doing some uh, research on that um, at present. So um, there's ongoing research about um, the contributions to, um, you know, a black, a Vict in black Vict by contributions by black Victorian Britons. Thank you. Yeah, I'll share that when Good we let you know, Carol. Thank you. And the final question is, why did Florence Nightingale lobby against Mary Seacole during um, getting recognition for her contribution? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I um, only understood that um, there was a, a little bit of a race to be the first uh, nurse in the UK. Um, and of course, if you think about the NHS even today, it is a it is a business, and um, it was really about um, you know it's being recognised and and also um, you know uh, putting that stamp on uh, nursing because uh, it was a, a business that was about to expand, uh, which is a very su successful business today. So, but um, yeah, it's only hearsay anyway. Brilliant, thank you. So that's all of the questions. So thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to, to join us, especially at lunchtime. And um, a huge thank you to Carol for putting this together for us. She's put an awful lot of time and effort into doing this. It was a brilliant presentation, so thank you. Thank you. Ben. Um, this has been recorded alongside all the other talks that we've done as part of Black History Month, and I'll make sure that they're available at the end of this week, if not at the beginning of next week, and they'll be on the Black History Month webpage. Um, if you have any questions, any further questions for Carol, make sure to just drop me them in an email and I can always um, get back to you. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining us and I'll let you get on with your days now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.